Hello and welcome back to A Shot of Wildlife. Today is my favourite day of the year. I've travelled down into deep dark Suffolk and I'm here at Westleton Heath hoping to see and film some red deer and then I'm going to pop over to Minsmere and hopefully see loads of other wildlife. So come on, let's get finding them. If you've been following this channel for a while, you'll be familiar with Westleton Heath, which is a place where I've seen and filmed red deer every autumn for the past five years. However, on this visit, there didn't seem to be any around. Well, I've made it to where the red deer normally are and I can't see any at the moment. And actually, in fact, it looks like it's almost completely empty out there. Nothing moving around at all. But, as you might be able to see, I have attached my Lynx Pro thermal monocular to the top of my camera. And through this, I can see that there is actually something alive out there. Let's take a look at it. Here's the view with the naked eye, and here is the view through the thermal monocular. I still haven't mastered focus in it yet, but these darker spots are the heat signatures of animals. And here is a closer look from a slightly different angle. These are stone curlew, and among the bracken and grass, there are about 15 of them. You might be wondering why they are just standing still and that's because they are nocturnal. After dark, they use their fantastic eyesight and long yellow legs to run around hunting for invertebrates. There are only around 330 breeding pairs in the UK, and these will be gathering here near the Suffolk coast before migrating south to Spain and northern Africa for the winter. Whilst checking the area for other heat signatures, I noticed something much larger coming out of the distant vegetation. It was a red deer stag. With his small antlers, this is a young animal, and it's probably his first proper rut. He was in a hurry and didn't stay in sight for very long, but if you hang around, you might see some of his competitors later in this video. Nearby, perched on a small shrub, was a bird that is usually seen in the air, a skylark. It soon became clear he wasn't alone, and he wasn't very happy about it. Skylarks usually sing to announce their territories in the breeding season, but apparently this one was a bit territorial all year round. With the intruder firmly dealt with, he soon returned to his rightful place. Well, not a terrible start to the day. Stone curlews, skylarks, and that one red deer. Now I'm gonna head down the road a little bit to RSPB Minsmere, and I'm sure I'm going to have a wildlife packed day. Can't wait. And I'm here, my favorite reserve of the country. I would say, probably. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit cold, it's a little bit windy. It's the coldest day of the year so far. It's about nine degrees at the moment. But that doesn't matter. Getting some hides and perhaps, or definitely see some wildlife, but perhaps see something interesting. Maybe even a bearded tit or two. I seem to get lost every time I go to Minsmere, but not this time. I was following an anti-clockwise route around the coast trail starting with the hide known as the Wildlife Lookout, although things got off to a bit of a bad start. I'm not sure if this is going to be a disaster or not, but I've just got to Wildlife Lookout. Look down the window, and they are doing some work on the lagoons. I don't know how that will affect the wildlife, whether that means I'm not going to see very much from here, or the next few hides, or what. All I can do is try. From Wildlife Lookout, I did have a great view of this dump truck, and thankfully, not all of the wildlife had vacated the area. This little egret was enjoying the extra shallow margins, searching for a bite to eat. I know I've shown this behaviour a few times on this channel, 
but look how it wafts its bright yellow feet through the water, hoping to scare any invertebrates or fish out into the open, where it can easily spear them with its dagger-like beak. It wasn't the only bird making the most of the lower water levels. Several pied wagtails were also here, searching the exposed mud for small creatures. Their diet is almost entirely made up of insects, so for them, this rich mud would be like an all-you-can-eat buffet. I moved on. South Hyde is not far from the wildlife lookout, and hopefully, here, there'll be more wildlife for me to look out on. And what a contrast in here. In the last hide, there was nothing apart from them wagtails and a little egret. But here, the water's normal, and that means that there are loads and loads of birds. In my opinion, this is one of the best placed hides at the reserve, giving great views over lots of water and lots of islands. One of the first species I'd like to share with you is the shell duck. With a chestnut ring around their bodies, and striking white and dark green markings, they are quite an easy duck to identify. They nest in cavities, and you might be surprised to hear that one of their most common nesting sites is down old rabbit burrows. An ever permanent feature of Minsmere is the Avocet. I only got a short clip of it before being distracted by this hovering kestrel. They do this to hunt, and can hold their position facing into the wind while scanning the area below for small mammals and insects. Back down on the water, this female northern shoveler swam by. Even from this slightly out of focus footage, she can be identified by her oversized bill. And there was a male here in the distance as well. Under the surface, he'll be swishing his bill from side to side and filtering out any small invertebrates and crustaceans that he can find. I'm sometimes guilty of overlooking common birds when I visit nature reserves, so here is a short clip of a carrion crow who had found something to eat on one of the islands. Like most corvids, they are opportunist omnivores, meaning they'll eat pretty much anything that they can find. So your guess is as good as mine as to what this one was eating here. The little egret had moved from the nearby mud puddle and was having a preen when someone came into the hide and gave me some interesting information. There's a shore lark from the shore up there. Oh, is there? I don't know if you know. And this meant it was time to get on the move. And I'm back on the move again. Apparently, I was speaking to someone in that hide and apparently there has been a shore lark seen um, on the coast here. There's quite a few people I can see in the distance standing around, so hopefully I'll get a chance to see one of them. I'm not sure I've ever seen a shore like before, but if I do, don't worry, I'll be sure to share it with you. I'd like to pretend that I deliberately said that I'd be sure to share the shore lark with you, but it was a happy accident. It wasn't far from here to where the reserve meets with the North Sea, at a shingle bank and a stretch of dunes. As I made my way towards the celebrity bird, another bird I've never knowingly seen before made an appearance. This is a female wheat ear. Until now, I've always suspected that their name comes from the darker patch they have behind their eye, which some creative namer may have suggested looks like a piece of wheat. But no. In fact, it comes from the Anglo-Saxon for white rump, which is apparently one of the bird's identifying features although I didn't get to see or film such markings. I carried on to where the crowds had gathered to watch the shorelark. This is another first for me, and gladly my camera has a great zoom so I can stay a good distance away and still get footage like this. Outside of the UK, shorelarks are known as horned larks because of the two tufts of feathers that they have behind their eyes. Here we know them as shorelarks because that is where they are mostly seen, in coastal areas. They nest in the high arctic and are rare migrants here, with only around 100 birds visiting each winter. This one was oblivious 
to the crowd that was watching it, and there was a member of the RSPB team nearby to keep people at a safe distance. I left the crowd and moved into East Hyde, which was too busy for me to feel comfortable speaking to the camera in, but there was still lots of wildlife that I can show you. Resting along one of the small islands in front of the hide was this flock of teal, the UK's smallest species of duck. This one is a male with his chestnut head and green cheeks, and behind him is a more plainly coloured female. Further out were a small flock of black-tailed gobwits feeding on creatures suspended in the water column, and occasionally using their long beaks to probe into the sediment. And closer in, an avocet was swishing its upcurved bill through the water, hoping to pick up some unwitting morsels. Well, so far so good. Lots and lots of birds, and obviously we saw that stag this morning. And maybe I'll show you some rabbits as well. Um, I think that's all for mammals. But now I'm going to head back into the main hide, or main reserve, to another hide. I need some dinner, um, and hopefully we'll see some more wildlife. With food on my mind, I took the recently installed boardwalk back towards the centre of the reserve, passing by this late peacock butterfly who was enjoying some overripe blackberries before stopping in at North Hyde. It was quite quiet in this hide, with the only animals in sight being this pair of Canada geese. And this which I filmed thinking it was an animal, but no, and this mount of dirt are your thing, it wasn't worth filming. On the way from North Hyde to the cafe, where I'd be stopping for lunch, I passed by this pond, where I've been lucky enough to see grass snakes in the past, and I got lucky again. Apparently this year, a family of water voles have moved into the pond, and some of the youngsters were putting on a bit of a show. Water voles are a token species when talking about the impacts of invasive animals. Their numbers drop by around 95% following the introduction of American mink into this country, but gradually they do seem to be making a comeback. Okay, no more distractions. I'm 6 foot tall and 17 stone. I need a lot of fuel to keep showing you wildlife, so it was time for some food. Of course, at such a great reserve as Minsmere, wildlife even joins you for dinner. These chaffinches were bouncing around on and under the tables, hoping for some scraps and crumbs. And this one, which had lost a leg somehow, was hopping about, expecting the same. I may or may not have given it some crumbs of carrot cake. My sugar levels are back to the maximum, but I'm running out of time. There's about an hour and a half left. Then I have to head back to um, the heath and hopefully see some red deer rutting. So two more hides, fingers crossed for some more wildlife. My next stop was Island Mere. Here in the summer I got very lucky and filmed my first ever bittern, but today it was almost the opposite. Lots of eyes were looking, but the only bit of wildlife I could see was this lone roosting cormorant. and then it was gone as well. Very much aware that I was running out of time, I moved on from Island Mere, heading towards the last hide of the day before I go back in search of red deer. On the way, I spotted some movement, and it would seem that my movement had been spotted as well, by this female muntjac. After a while, she decided to ignore me and came back to forage along the edge of a reed bed. Bitten Hyde is up a tower and does give amazing views over the reeds, although I only stopped for a minute before carrying on with my journey. It's been a bit of a quiet afternoon, but the day is not over. I'm now about to leave Minsmere, head back to the heath, hopefully see some deer, and hopefully see some other stuff as well, but let's just see some deer first, shall we?
So I've made it back to the heath and the red deer are here. There's way more than one this time. I can see at least a proper stag out there, lots of hinds. Let's take a closer look at them. I didn't count, but I suspect there are more than a hundred red deer out in front of me. Mostly females, which are known as hinds, peppered with males, which are known as stags. Notice here how not only does the stag have antlers, but it is also much larger than the hinds. In fact, red deer stags are the UK's largest land mammal, growing to up to 200 kilos in weight. It takes males at least three years to have a proper set of antlers. This is a two-year-old and will mostly be tolerated by the larger stags, but they are not very good at tolerating each other. This was the largest stag here, who was persistently following this hind. She will soon be ready to mate and he doesn't want to miss his chance. Other stags waited on the outskirts of the main herd. You've probably seen videos of them fighting one another and although I would love to show you that, it seems that they had already sorted out a pecking order and were giving each other a wide berth. As the sun went down, I started to head back towards the car when I got a quick glimpse of one of the stone curlews, who seemed to be getting ready for a night of feeding. And that is where today's video comes to an end. If you enjoyed it, then check out this video on the screen now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.